Hello, my name is John Milburn for Central Queensland University. Today we deal with international environmental law. And overcoming serious environmental issues requires international cooperation. Simply, environmental issues do not stay within national boundaries and issues that may have previously been dealt with entirely at a domestic level now may have international implications. In international law, global interests are influenced by member state concerns, and that relates particularly to economic interests. Many principles and concepts, such as economically sustainable development, now encompassed in domestic law, began at an international level. When I speak of international law, I refer to public international law, which is the law that regulates legal matters between states. And when I talk of states in an international context, consider that as countries or nations. International law and international institutions provide a framework for cooperation and collaboration between members of the international community. However, unlike domestic law, the implementation and enforcement of International law relies largely on consensus and the voluntary acceptance of the law by member states. The result is that enforcement of international law is not strong. International environmental law comprises substantive procedural and institutional rules of international law, primarily with the objective of protecting the environment. The approach to international law by member states regarding the environment reflects scientific categorizations and political and economic concerns. Ecological sustainable development integrates human considerations such as economic development and maintenance of cultural, economic, physical and social well-being of people and communities with environmental issues. And sometimes these principles become part of our domestic law. Queensland legislation provides a system for achieving ecological sustainability and does, through the, does so through the creation and implementation of planning policies, regional plans and planning schemes. International law is reflected in agreement between member states. A landmark conference is the UN conference on the human environment held in Stockholm in 1972. In 1992, Rio de Janeiro hosted the UN Conference on the Environment and Development. And the charter of the Rio Conference was to create strategies and measures to halt and reverse the effects of environmental degradation by national and international efforts to promote sustainable and environmentally sound development in all countries. So states are the primary subjects of international law, that is public international law. Member states consider issues at a global, regional, sub-regional and bilateral level. And the focal point for international law and institutions regarding the environment is the United Nations. Environmental treaties establish many organisations and these treaties are targeted to identify issues in environmental law, such as air pollution, ozone climate change, oceans, seas, world heritage, biological diversity, and environmental impact assessment. So what are the sources of international law? International law comprises the body of rules that are binding on states in their dealing with each other refer to the Statute of the International Court of Justice, or the ICJ. International law comprises four sources. Treaties, international customary law, general principles of law, and subsidiary sources, such as decisions of courts, tribunals, and the writing of jurists. Let's deal with those in turn. First, treaties. 
Treaties are also referred to as conventions or records, agreements or protocols. And they pro comprise the primary source of international legal rights and obligations in relation to environmental protection. A treaty can be adopted bilaterally, regionally or globally. As interest in environmental issues has grown, so has the number of treaties relating to environmental matters, that is, particularly since the 80s. And treaties provide the way that they come into force, uh, that is usually upon ratification by a certain number of states. When member states do not have an economic interest in the content of the treaty, let's say whaling, it is more likely to immediately ratify the agreement than in circumstances where ratifying a treaty will affect its economic interest. Nations become bound by the terms of a convention or treaty, not by signature, but by the act of rat ratification. Signature merely represents an intention to be bound. In Australia, it is the federal government, not the parliament, that makes the decision to ratify a treaty and it does so after consultation with the states. Environmental treaties create a framework from which further negotiation and protocols are later considered. The second source is international customary law. Customary international law is secondary to treaties in importance, but still significant. And international custom is essentially the generally accepted international practice on a matter. The third source of international law regarding the environment is the general principles of law. And general principles of international law relate to such things as good faith in the exercise of rights or prohibitions, where the actions of the state influence other nations. The general principle of international law is something accepted by civilizations as appropriate. Take principle 21 of the Stockholm Declaration and principle two of the Rio Declaration that relate to the basic principle that a state should not cause environmental damage to neighboring states. And that principle of neighborliness is enunciated in article 74 of the UN Charter in relation to social, economic and commercial matters. And finally, there are subsidiary sources of our international law. The main subsidiary sources being the decisions of courts and tribunals, and also the writing of jurists. In that regard, uh, regarding decisions, consider the um, International Court of Justice. So how are international laws enforced? Ensuring compliance with international environmental obligations is a serious concern. Now, negotiations and dispute resolution are usually the first options. Dispute resolution by way of mediation or conciliation in, implies upon the states that participate a willingness to do so in good faith and a willingness to enter a binding resolution. And states themselves have the primary role in enforcing international environmental law. Apart from mediation and conciliation, States may agree to fact-finding appointments or submit to arbitration. International arbitration occurs where member states appoint judges or arbitrators to determine legal issues and engage in good faith and then submit to the award made by the arbitrator. The International Court of Justice at The Hague is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations and the International Court of Justice does consider international environmental disputes. But the issue of compliance remains a difficult part of the international lawmaking process. It applies largely through international cooperation and a voluntary willingness to submit to alternative dispute resolution procedures, arbitrations, or the filing of courts or tribunals. Beyond that, enforcement of an agreement, an award or an order is problematic. 
What are the general principles in environmental law? Many principles were discussed at both Stockholm and Rio and have become part of the international and domestic environmental law. For example, principles of preventative action, cooperation, sustainable development, inter intergenerational equity, and the precautionary principle were established at an international level. As the name suggests, the principle of preventative action imposes an obligation on member states to reduce or limit or control activities that might cause a risk of damage to the environment. The concept of sustainable development is now well entrenched in international law and domestic law. International intergenerational equity reflects the fact that members of the present generation hold the earth on trust or in trust for the benefit of future generations. And the precautionary principle provides guidance to decision maker about making approvals for developments where there is circumstance, sorry, there is scientific uncertainty. The government may be answerable to the international community for its conduct, but international law does not have direct force in Australia until enacted by domestic law through parliaments in Australia. In that regard, look to the Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs against TO, 1995 183 CLR at 273. It follows that a breach of an international obligation is not enforceable per se in Australian courts. Thank you for your attendance today.